Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, welcome to the AWS Melbourne office for those that haven't been here before. Um, we hope to see you again soon anyway. My name's Andrew, I'm part of the local AWS team and I'm one of the account managers. Um, and today we're uh, going to talk about how to move to AWS using a DevOps approach and we're lucky enough to have a number of panelists join us today um, who are current customers of AWS and of Base2 services. And hopefully throughout the course of today we'll um, inspire you and educate you through the stories that these gentlemen have to share on how you can also get some of the benefits of using a DevOps approach enabled by AWS. So today I want to introduce our speakers um, and we've got a number of key speakers coming from Service Stream, uh, Emergency Management Victoria and right. Open Universities. So just a little bit on each organisation. Uh, Open Universities is a national leader in online learning and uh, they've executed a number of projects and delivered a series of applications to migrate onto AWS using a DevOps approach. Um, we're going to have John Owens from Service Stream and he's going to talk about um, how they've approached uh, their AWS projects and Service Stream is in a wide range of areas around uh, the essential communications energy and the water networks and the supporting services around those um, essential utilities. And Service Stream have engaged in an IT transformation project to streamline the applications um, and they've labelled those uh, as essential services. And uh, Michael Jenkins from the Emergency Management of Victoria, um, they're the overarching body which supports and enables uh, the Energy Management Commissioner to actually fulfil his role for the state of Victoria. Uh, so the EMV have developed a new internet-based system that is available to all the emergency management um, agencies in the state. So looking forward to hearing about how they went and did that and how their journey into DevOps started off and where they're at to today. So I just might take five minutes to level set what we actually are here to talk about and that's um, this idea of DevOps. And DevOps is really like a, uh, it's a religion to many people, I don't think there's one interpretation of DevOps, but I might sort of open the floor by suggesting a very simple definition of DevOps. And I would define it as developers working together with operations people to get things done faster in an automated way and a repeatable way. Very simplistic, but I hope today that we use that foundational definition with the stories of our customers to actually understand further what that means in your own business and how that pertains to your own projects. Now the AWS role in this place is really the technology underpinning AWS is an enabler for the DevOps practices that we'll be hearing about today. And that's the idea of being able to implement infrastructure on demand, be able to implement um, a pay-as-you-go commercial model around using IT infrastructure services and not be limited by scale and not be limited by any risks that you might be otherwise unwilling to take in trying new projects in an effort to get products out faster, more automated and to really get into this whole idea of agile development. So without further ado, I might hand over to uh, Steve, who's going to talk about um, their projects and how they achieved um, the outcomes uh, in the DevOps world. Cheers. Steve. All right. Thanks, Andrew. It was nice that I was the only person that didn't get named in the <laughs> intro. <laughs> Obviously, um, too, too unimportant to matter. Uh, anyway, um, my name's Steve McTaggart. I'll, I'll, I'll look after that. I'm currently the manager of uh, web development and continuous delivery at Open Universities Australia. So um, for those of you that aren't sure of what um, OUA is, um, as Andrew was saying, we're, a, um, we're the leader in online education in Australia, providing open ed access education delivered online, um, relatively exclusively online to people um, all around Australia and actually even off the Australian borders as well. Um, but uh, recently the education market in Australia has undergone some change. There's been um, a lot more pushes by more uh, emerging education uh, vendors, uh, universities to deliver their content directly to customers, um, more new markets. You've seen probably all the advertising for a whole lot of uh, you know vocational education um, training organisations coming up looking for government funding. There were a whole lot of changes that, that hit us as a business um, that really affected um, the, the core higher education space that we were looking at. And the, the board and the business came to um, the IT and the business transformation teams um, about three years ago and threw a challenge at us to begin the diversification of our portfolio. 
Uh, and the first of those was an initiative called Open to Study. So I'm not sure if anyone's actually seen Open to Study or aware of it, but it was a, um, it's, a it's a free online uh, training system, uh, education delivery um, platform that is um, sort of leveraging that MOOCs uh, massively online open courses component. Um, and the part of there that's important is that massively piece. So they came to us as a business that had been sort of delivering a similar uh, technology on a relatively stable stack for a fairly long period of time and through this new challenge of a new business and a new technology um, and, and a new market at us. And um, we weren't sure what the scale was going to be were like. It was actually a bit of a risk. We weren't even sure if we were going to be doing this six months after we launched it. Uh, and so we took a route, um, you know, much more than what you might hear from some of the other guys that went a DevOps first approach we really went sort of a cloud-first approach. We needed the, the, the things that Andrew was talking about, the flexibility, the scalability, the, the scale from the platform, first of all, to be able to deliver open to study. And within six months of um, actually being incepted with the problem, we launched open to study with, I think, 15 courses, um, and now there are 49 courses sitting on the platform um, you know, two years later. Uh, it's entirely AWS hosted. It's entirely configuration managed and configuration deployed, all of the cool buzzwords that you'll talk about today. But if we hadn't gone down that sort of test-oriented, you know, try, quick, fail, fast type um, approach, we would never have been able to deliver open to study. Uh, and then because of that great success, they came back and challenged us again and said, so we're, we're playing very big in the higher education space. What are we doing in this emerging vocational space? Um, and so we, we were basically challenged again to take the platform and the technology and the business enablement feature that we'd been able to deliver and turn around Open Training Institute. So that's the most recently released, launched December 27th last year. What a great day to launch. Um, uh, our vocational education and training business delivering nationally accredited courses online. And it took all of those learnings of um, agile platform development, agile application development, and married those together to, again, be able to deliver an entire business, which actually has a commercial model attached to it, uh, 24 courses of content covering 200 and something units of delivery in five and a half months, from not existing at all to running in production. Right? A relatively massive undertaking, um, and actually using those practices in the DevOps culture, in the agile delivery practices, um, were the only way that we could succeed. Um, even provisioning, you know, just trying to get one of the boxes that we may have needed historically to, to even run the first dev environment would have been a massive challenge without that agile flexibility. Um, I think I've got heaps more I'll talk about, but I'll let these guys kick on in the intro. Um, but yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Yep. So um, I've got a quick question sure. and it was something that I picked up it was you mentioned that you didn't initially start off with the DevOps approach in mind but you went with the cloud first approach correct as a as a priority yes at what point in the journey did you discover that hey the practices that we're starting to deploy actually marry quite well into having a DevOps type of definitely approach what was that um, what was that point so it's one of those things that I guess it's hard to find the specific point time in which it happened um, it, it's like running I guess you eventually realize you're doing it after the fact that you've you've done it but um, it, it was the enablement capability so because uh, the, the AWS cloud gave us a, a, what I consider infinite infrastructure um, it allowed us to to develop a lot more but what it gave us was a whole series of new challenges you know, there was a lot more to manage. Um, actually trying to do those processes over and over and over again became um, a, a bottleneck. And so it forced us into finding ways people had solved things with automation, with repeatability, with you know, isolation, with single concern. I mean, these are good architectural principles that we sort of talk about, mm. but usually in fixed hardware, you have a problem where we have no choice but to put it on that existing piece of hardware. And by by being able to spin up lots of really small machines and isolate the architecture, um, you know, you do that. But they create these really complex solutions that are hard to manage and hard to keep in your head or hard to keep accurate in a diagram. Mm. So it, we sort of fell into it a lot more than um, we specifically walked into it. We're now kicking off a major project to move the rest of open universities up to AWS and we're now coming at it from this actual, from all of our experience and our learnings and engaging with some, you know, different AWS partners to actually take the DevOps first approach. Sensational. Uh, just want to add to the forum that we're going to actually open up the floor if we have time to questions after the, um, the speakers have gone through their stories. But in the meantime, we do have a phone number and an email that you could actually submit questions to right here, right now. 
um, and they will come up shortly on the slide deck as well. So just keep an eye out for that and as people talk, feel free to note down your questions and send them through to us. So I might hand over to John to uh, talk about their story and, and, and uh, maybe learn a little bit more yep. about ServiceStream. Yeah, so my name's John Owens. I'm the Integration Manager for ServiceStream. Um, I think you gave a pretty good overview of uh, ServiceStream, but I think uh, another definition would be we're a service delivery partner for the telecoms and energy and water industry. Um, so our journey really started about two and a half years ago, and it wasn't specifically DevOps. It was in, sort of inspired by a historical way that we delivered projects. Um, when we had a contract, we'd build a system, um, and it would only be used for that system, and then it would go away. And it wasn't a you know, very cost saving, it wasn't a very efficient way of doing things. So a program kicked off to start consolidating all of our core systems um, down to a single capability on one system. So things that were previously developed um, were pushed towards becoming a you know, commercial off the shelf, uh, moving towards a SaaS model, uh, getting down to this core platform, which as I mentioned before, become a key central platform for us, which is it's part of, partly a branding exercise, but is a just a way of start referring to our entire platform. So we came, we came down with all these solutions. We have you know, um, an outcome for, say, supply chain for our infield for um, our, how we pay contractors, and then we needed some way of tying it all together. We needed some way of integrating it. We needed some way of delivering these outcomes a lot quicker, and that's really where DevOps sort of came in for us. So we took an initial, just one of our contracts, which we'd you know, recently won. Um, we kept it fairly simple. Um, it was only four integrations in total. Um, this is all going to be on, say, a, on the AWS platform with an ESB to kind of tie it all together. Um, we kept it fairly simple. So we had you know, a small set of integrations, a small set of um, monitoring requirements because we needed to deliver it within four weeks. So keeping that simple was great, but what we had to get in place was a pipeline that would fit in with our dev and the ops capabilities provided by our partners. So we spent a lot of time getting that right. We wanted to spend a lot of time making sure that our code that you know, got into our test environment worked. We wanted to make sure that it passed all our integration tests. We wanted to make sure that we were communicating with the ops team to make sure they're aware of what our requirements are, what our, how, how much um, processing is needed going to go into our systems. So we had to get this process in place to get things out there sooner, so to get things out there quicker. So that was our initial process. We, we did deliver it. We delivered it in about four weeks. Um, and then from that point onwards, we, it was a very iterative process. As we brought on more contracts, we then expanded our infrastructure. Um, you know, we were able to increase the size of it. We were able to um, expand it out onto other platforms. We started bringing in things like you know, uh, log shipping, um, things like advanced monitoring, um, B2B gateway type capabilities. And this was only possible just because of how, how we approached that methodology, how we worked really closely with the operations teams so that they knew what we needed to get there quickly. Um, now, I think the only way this type of thing was possible for us um, was that it was really it was sponsored from the top. So I don't think it would have been accepted that previously they wouldn't have used AWS, they wouldn't have used these sort of external products, but it was part of our kind of strategic goals and strategic <coughs> values to get that direction. So it was very much a, you know, sponsored from our um, top level down. I think that, that really covers, I don't want to go into too much detail, because I think a lot of my experience has been specifically technical. I don't want to get into it too much. Um, sure. Was, was there anything specific you wanted to? No, I think I think you've spoken about a lot of the business outcomes and a lot of the drivers, and a yeah. few of the questions that will, that people have already submitted. I think we'll, yeah. we'll go into. I, our I next mean, it's probably it's probably a good point. Uh, you know, a lot of it was you know getting our time to market, reducing our cost, um, you know, delivering a product quicker. I mean, if, if we take a more recent example, so we've now current iteration, our non-product product environments um, now shut down after hours. They automatically shut down. We spin them back up, and because of the way AWS works. Um, you know, we're not being charged for that. So the, w the way our environment's in place, we you know, just reduce costs just by iterating on it, just by, um, that's how we design it. So if we take, say, another example, if we've got parallel projects working in streams, we can spin up new environments as we want them. We can provide an environment that's dedicated specifically to a project outcome, and then shut it down and merge it back into our main dev stream. Lovely. Thank you for that example. Right. We might sort of circle back and, and take some questions a little bit later, but I wanted to give Michael an opportunity to talk about his story as well and um, hear about how a, uh, a government department has utilised AWS and, and used the DevOps uh, methodology to, to bring product to market. Thank you. Uh, so, Michael Jenkins, I'm the Chief Architect of uh, the Victorian Information Network for Emergencies, which is an initiative of the Emergency Management Victoria um, Department uh, within the Department of Justice. 
So my experience here with, with DevOps, particularly in the government space, uh, really began at the start of this year when we had a, a major initiative which we had planned to uh, <coughs> bring together all of the different agencies that are involved in emergency management plus other organisations over time and give them one system to collaborate within and to improve the, the effectiveness of their management of emergencies and coordination of their, their different responders against an emergency. So we started that project um, in collaboration with uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, uh, with a piece of software which was quite complex in design and, uh, and architecture with the challenge then of taking this software uh, out of the US for the first time, out of MIT for the first time and establishing it within Australia. So what we set up as being the tenets of our project from day one were agile, on-demand DevOps. And what we, what we did is from the very start, the very concept phase of this project, we established those as being the driving principles um, and tying all of those together really was automation as a foundation element of what we would do. We set a rule that whatever we do, particularly for infrastructure, for testing, for um, quality assurance, load, etc., <coughs> development pipelines and the rest, that had to be automated. Uh, which meant that we needed to have the operations team and skill set integrated very closely into that team from day one because you can't hand over responsibility to a third party and get something back months later and hope that it fits into your picture or, or your design. By, instead, by putting together a team which was that integrated team, within the first month we had taken this software from MIT and deployed it at production scale within AWS in a working demonstrable form through cloud formation, through uh, Jenkins CI, automation CI pipeline. We had a working system almost from day one that could be demonstrated to the stakeholders across the state and to the people who are holding the, the purses of the, the project. Um, from that point on, every step along the way in terms of customising, enhancing and developing the platform that we, we put together was an increment. It was a, whether it was changing the, the design or the, the architecture of the application stack or changing a feature within the product, every point it was a, a controlled change automated and automated within a pipeline which would push that control change into an appropriate uh, environment, either at production scale or at development scale. <coughs> so our experience there has been that by bringing together a DevOps, an agile DevOps team of we, as we've termed it, we've been able to <coughs> almost eliminate the pain of infrastructure change through the life of a project and we've reached the point, and this system's now in production after roughly eight months of, you know, from go to woe. Um, we, we've reached the point where that system almost slid gracefully into production. There was no hurdle, no great decision point near the end. What we found was that we were ready for production because we had been paying attention to the operational elements of the system, be it performance testing, manageability, monitoring, from you know, that first month of the project. So. I suppose the, the concept to architecture, to infrastructure, to operations um, process has actually become more of a cycle for us. We can have a concept in terms of what we need the system to do. We can develop the architecture which will support our deployment of that system, automate the infrastructure build and de deliver that into operations and then revisit, tune and continuously improve on that process, every element of the, the system using that process. Um, so really, you know, our takeaways are that uh, without a DevOps type, type of approach, we would still be, we would still be waiting on a, on a separate operations team somewhere in the, else in the business or uh, as an external party to, to deliver to our requirements. And we would have spent a lot of time developing requirements which they would need to deliver to. Instead, by integrating ops into the, the Agile team, they've had the, the ability to respond quickly and keep up with the pace of the development and the change that our de Agile development team has been able to produce. So it's been, it's been a real win for us. Thanks, Michael.
that was actually quite an interesting point. The, the very last couple of sentences is about people, and I think people are really key to being successful in this area. So I might just sort of ask all three of you, and maybe Michael, you could um, go first and talk to a little bit about what sort of people did you have in your teams? Um, where did they come from, and what sort of experience or drive did they need for change to happen in the way you actually deployed this project? Um, so in this particular project, we structured it uh, based around, I, I suppose, best of breed vendors from across, uh, across the state. So we really wanted to bring in um, partners from uh, d distinct specialisations across the, the IT industry that we had available to us. So we, we sought out uh, what we consider to be some of the best developers that we can find in, in the state. We sought out base two for some of the best infrastructure and ops side of DevOps that we could find. Uh, we tied that together with a very strong internal team, providing a, a lot of technical and, architect and enterprise architectural leadership uh, under the uh, very clear direction of the Victorian Information Network uh, for emergency um, guiding force. And that, that was a bit of a challenge, bringing together the different vendors into one cohesive team. But again, if we hadn't integrated them into a team and, and kept them as separate parties, I don't think we would be would have mm. been as successful. Would you have a comment on how big the team was in terms of, you know, the Amazon.com way is to this idea of a two pizza team, and we attain um, a, a speed to market based on the fact that more um, product can be produced with uh, more owners in the team. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there are more physical people in that team. They just take the product from go to woe in its entirety and deliver on the outcome. Would you? Would anyone like to comment on whether or not? a smaller team worked better for them in their situation, in their transition into DevOps and people and culture change? Yeah, I mean, if I take my example, I actually started, I had no team, so part of my role there was actually build a team together. So I had the opportunity of, we brought on some people that, um, some of our vendors that had the capability and knowledge of the Dev and Ops, and my job was to bring in that Dev capability within our team. So I was kind of in a luxury position where I didn't have to change too much culture with my team, that was just, that's what you had to do. Um, I think it's, you know, o overall it's, it's, it's definitely benefited the sort of extended applications teams. The kind of perception of automation and how it all works together has definitely flowed on to um, how people um, interact with each other. I, part of the problem, even in sort of small IT shops, it's become that they act in siloed ways, that, you know, I'm just the guy for this application, I'm just the guy for this application, whereas my integration teams sort of started seeing across all these areas. Um, so they sort of encourage this commu communication even just within the app space. Um, and that, that's a small team. And I think a small team you know, really helped us. Even with our initial implementation, there was maybe a total of five people um, with a project manager on top of it. It was very small, but we still delivered the outcomes required for the business. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah, that would be, um, that would be very similar to, to us. I mean, our, our technology team um, for delivering, say, open training was probably pretty large in comparison. There may have been 35 or 40 people probably involved, but that was across everything from change management of, um, you know, we were delivering an entirely new business line. So mm -hmm. this was, you know, training and, and procedural management for the call center and contact pieces all the way through. All of that was supported by basically one and a half operations guys because um, what, what we found is that those actions of regular deployments, regular changes to infrastructure, they, they ha they're actually one of the most frequent things that happen, especially in that, in that early genesis evolving stage. Um, mm. So actually investing in automation and investing in reproducibility means that you, you, you actually, most of the work isn't done by you. Most of the work is done by Jenkins or Bamboo or some sort of you know, cloud formation, whatever automation piece that you're done. And, you, and the ops guys are much more like conductors at the front of the orchestra um, than they are actually trying to perform all those actions. So we, as I said, we fell into it a bit. We got a couple of uh, guys who were much more classically sysadmins um, and really challenged them to say, we need you to be able to do this like seven times a day. And the only way you can do that is not by doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, our ops team was really small, but was able to provide massive, massive flexibility and constant change to that big team, right? You know, 30, 40 people of, of technical change that was happening on top of it. And that gave us room for, for lots of sub-teams of experimentation and new technologies and platforms. Mm -hmm. Great. We might um, move on to the, some of the questions, because I think we've touched on some of the areas already that, um, that have been of interest from you. So the question is, um, what approaches did you use to minimise political issues between the dev and ops team? 
and any external people when defining responsibilities and their roles. And I think as, um, as an external person looking into customers adopting some of these projects, I think this is quite important. Um, so thank you for whoever submitted that. Um, I might suggest, Michael, if, if you'd like to have a go at telling us uh, what do you think, um, how did it play out in your organisation between Dev and Ops? And I guess in your instance it was a little bit of a greenfield project, so mm. uh, you know the overarching outcome I guess was the priority there. Um, but tell us what your perception on that is. Yeah, I guess we always have an expectation that uh, public sector and government uh, is going to be politically charged, that we have a lot of people in, in government who um, who perhaps might choose to try and defend their patch, maybe. Um, that's the perception, it hasn't been my experience. So in this particular project and, and generally within Emergency Management Victoria, um, my experience here has been that the DevOps way of working has been very well respected by the other departments and agencies and organisations within government. Uh, particularly when we've been working with emergency management um, as personnel, people who respond to and, and react to um, emergencies in their day jobs, there's been a lot of respect for, for the idea that DevOps is a way of just getting down and getting it done rather than getting uh, tied up with bureaucracy. So where we've had particularly strong interactions around the, the different departments, it's generally been very favourable. Everybody wants to help, everybody wants to, to hear how we're doing it and, um, and to, to some degree, there's been a bit of envy across the, the different departments who want to do it that way. There's we want to too. use Amazon, yeah. we want to be more agile, we want to use the tools mm. that make us productive rather than fitting our productivity into the tools that are available. Mm -hmm. So um, politically, uh, within, the, within the team, in terms of building up a de an effective DevOps team, um, probably the only, only hurdle which we, we really faced, and it was quite early on, was making sure that we had um, the, the agile practices that we were using in the agile in the development team, that those were extended effectively and completely into the operations side of the DevOps equation as well. So stand-ups and storyboards and tracking, <coughs> tracking activities through a clear, um, a clear life cycle. That was very important to us and we had to, to bring along um, all of the parties to make sure that we worked effectively with the same practices yeah. rather than trying to fit two different or three different practices together. Mm -hmm. Yep. Steve or James, any yeah, I was gonna comments say, there? Yeah. Our issues wouldn't have been weren't DevOps. I think we've got the same, uh, we have very similar type of culture. Is um, We already have a, had a fairly strong agile practice and so there was already buy-in from lots of people on delivery. Um, but because of historical control that operations usually have over infrastructure, um, it, was, it was actually breaking those walls down. You know, because it was code, because it was actually in a repository that sat alongside the code that was the application, um, you could, the developers could touch, mm -hmm. right? They could tinker, they could, you know, and we've got version control on it, right? I mean, we're protected by the practices. So they might know some weird kernel parameter or some weird override that would be really beneficial, that would be helpful to do, instead of going through the change management practice to let someone know to make it happen and be, have it lost in translation. We're actually much closer to the code. Mm -hmm. So that piece happened. I, I think the only issues we had um, politically wise were, would have been around um, more the cloud than the DevOps piece. You know? um, we started open to study just as the AWS Sydney region appeared, which sort of negated a large amount of the naysayers previously about offshoring um, data and content and that. Um, but that's, that issue seems to be, you know, I know Amazon's one of, the, one of their biggest challenges at the moment is to educate people on, on what this means and how to work that. That would have been our biggest um, hesitancy if at any point in time was um, just proving that it actually you know, it can work and that it's secure and managed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Uh, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think uh, for us it was actually quite an easy conversation. If we still have the internal infrastructure team and we have the, um, the partnered op DevOps team. But what we found really easy for us was that um, what we wanted to deploy was a Linux system and we've got a very traditional Microsoft shop so it was very much mm -hmm. a, and we had nothing to do with it at that point in time, which was their sort of initial approach and What's happened now is now that, it's, now that it's out there and deployed, they've started to see the value in moving things off some of their internal infrastructure back onto the AWS side. So things like our internal SFTPs is now they want to get rid of it, move it off and set it in front of you know, AWS backed by an S3 mm -hmm. um, storage. Lovely. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. 
Um, the next question you've submitted is, how did AWS enable your DevOps approach? And um, I might open this up to whoever wants to go first, really, because I think you've all had exposure to, to the AWS through your projects. Um, may, maybe, John, if you'd like to. Uh, I think I've sort of briefly touched on it, but I think the key thing is really just getting something that you can touch quicker. It's, it's that, that delay in your, your dev pipeline of waiting on a server or a piece of infrastructure to turn up before you can do anything um, you know, can kill projects sometimes. So having that available to your developers really early on really makes a difference. Um, you know, it fits into our pipeline um, and I reckon it's incredibly important for us delivering things in you know, the timeframes that were expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. yeah, no question that the, uh, the on-demand infrastructure makes a huge difference to the productivity and, and how quickly you can have something running and up and running. But for us, I think the, the key enabler from AWS is actually cloud formation and being able to treat the entire environment stack, infrastructure stack as a piece of code that can then be, as you mentioned, version controlled and iterated. Um, that, without that, we wouldn't have been able to move anywhere near as quickly with DevOps. And, and we are plus one to both of those. The other thing it also taught us is um, to API things. So we can treat our infrastructure as an API and, and call that. So how do we treat our systems and solutions like that? So what are we building? How do we make it programmatic to make an action happen so that we can connect it up to our automation tool chain if you know, resetting a user's password requires you to log into the application and click through and do it? it becomes hard to do that if you're doing an environment migration where I need to reset the passwords. And what happens is you don't, so then your security becomes compromised and it flows down. Once you start to get into API everything, um, which is what, you know, what we would take from the lead that, that Amazon have, is we can definitely enable ourselves to deliver our own solutions in the same model. That's been really important for us. Mm -hmm. I've got a really good question from a member of the audience. Um, are any of you working in an ITIL environment Pause. And how have you managed the potential conflicts between DevOps and ITIL? So this is completely open, so I'd, I'm not going to pin someone down to provide a response, but if anyone's got any experience I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that briefly from my, my limited experience in here. Um, so the Department of Justice is an ITIL environment, or yeah, largely ITIL based. Um, and that hasn't, it hasn't been a, a problem for us. What we've needed to do is establish appropriate change and release management interfaces so that we can have close to continuous uh, deployment without uh, bypassing the ITIL, like the CAB and the other ITIL controls. So in practice, we haven't seen any great conflict between DevOps and ITIL, not to date at least. Yeah. I'll, I'll echo those comments. We, we've, you know, we've got an ITIL practice, we, we have to go to CAB. Um, what we have found is things that we've been able to prove are repeatable, so how we do particular uh, deployments and show that they don't impact, we don't need to, we've been able to have them as when they're ready to go, not wait for CAB to actually deploy them. So we've been able to show that it's a repeatable process, we can roll back easily, so we can run outside the normal CAB windows. Mm. I'm just going to say plus one. You're plus one to that <laughs> one. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, I'll just go through one of the other questions that we had. It was, how did you develop the right culture in the team uh, to deliver the DevOps outcome? Um, I might sort of ask Michael. To, to leave uh, that I one. think I've, I've pretty much covered this. In terms of culture, it was really just making it very clear that we are one team, that we are working together to have the, the ceremonies shared with all of the parties. Um, so making sure that you know, this is overall is an agile DevOps project, so therefore devs, QAs, architects and ops are all part of that team. They all need to come to the showcases. They all get a uh, an opportunity to share their experiences in the showcases. They all come to the stand-ups. They all mm -hmm. tell us what they're working on. When they need help, they turn to other people within the team and it goes both ways. So the developers got help from the operations guys. The operations guys got some input from the devs. Uh, and in fact, there were staff within the team who were, were quite comfortable in both areas and could pick up tickets or pick up cards which were either operations related or code related and that worked very well for us. I might extend that question to the other panellists. Do you actually have um, a communal stand-up mechanism? Do you actually do some of these activities to cultivate? Definitely. So, I culture? mean, our, our major deliveries in, in the last two years have been project-oriented, which have been um, you know, heavy agile practices. As I was saying, we're, we're undertaking a large project at the moment to, to migrate all of the rest of OUA's solutions um, 
into this practice and, and also into the cloud. Um, one of the key things is our delivery teams, you know, in my recent change has been to, to get the operations guides embedded actually into our delivery teams. So they now actually have um, a staff member, you know, in their team that's skilled in that skill set and that capability and knows how to talk it, knows how to walk it to empower that team as a unit to deliver. And that, that cultural change, is, it's, it's about responsibility and accountability, giving them, um, giving them the responsibility and making them understand what our responsibility to them as the business are, um, but holding them accountable. And if you don't give them all the tools and all the ability to manage that change and, and drive it, then they can't do both of those. Mm -hmm. That's really, that, and, and that operations piece, dev doesn't matter. What matters is what we release to prod. That's what our customers see. Mm -hmm. That's what actually matters. We want to get that as quick as possible from dev to there, but not at the expense of quality and stability and all of those things. So I might just sort of extend one thing that you said there, and it leads into the next question, and it's, um, is Agile important in a DevOps approach? Do you need to have an Agile approach to have a DevOps approach? Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> is the simple answer. Um, <coughs> Agile, uh, DevOps is Agile infrastructure. That's what I would, that's my definition. Um, it's not, it's about bringing that development, uh, that development culture of experimentation of, of code, um, of some of those creative elements um, and dragging them back into the ops team, which have often been stifled by um, fixed constraints and fixed limitations. And when we start to unlock uh, the, the capacity for them to do levels of experimentation, um, we've seen some amazing solutions that, that come out because they can, you know, they can not have to know exactly how the application works, but we want to look at moving off Memcache and move on to Elasticache because there might be some benefit there. Um, it's relatively cheap and easy and quick for them to be able to experiment, but they need, they need that sort of development <coughs> practice. And you've got to be willing to quickly iterate, to potentially fail, to try things that may not work. Mm -hmm. um, and feedback, Agile is all about feedback and DevOps is all about feedback. Is getting prod mm -hmm. feedback back into dev as quick as possible and dev feedback as quickly into prod. Mm -hmm. Michael, would you agree? Would, uh, would you think the Agile approach is hand in hand with uh, a DevOps approach? Uh, absolutely the best way, to, best way to do it, right? Uh, and in fact, I'd say an Agile DevOps on demand, those three elements make, a, make the project much more likely to succeed, much more likely to succeed on time and under budget. Um, but I think in the strictest definition of DevOps, no, I don't think it's literally technically required, right? I can conceive of a waterfall style project which has team members who are operations and dev um, working together but on their assigned tasks. Yeah, it, it can work, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, thinking back 10, 15 years before Agile was so commonplace, I, I've worked on projects which were were run similar to that and, and were successful. But today, and in, particularly with the degree of complexity that we're dealing with in these types of systems, I don't think it would be anywhere near as likely to be successful if you attempted DevOps without Agile. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> keeping on the theme of people and culture, I've got another question from the audience. Um, after moving to DevOps, did you find you didn't have the right people in the right roles? For example, the dev manager not embracing the change, question mark, how did you deal with this? Did you have any staff turnover during this transformation? Assuming some of you did go through a transformation, others are a bit more greenfield, so. Yeah. I, for, for me, no, like I said before, I had to build the team, so I was the dev manager, really. Yep. So I don't think I had that cultural problem. I had possibly cultural problems with peers. Um, there's a lot of different approaches, so there's a lot of Microsoft ways of doing things, um, whereas we're coming in very much from a, you know, open source, um, Linux, Java type view. Um, so there was a clash of personalities there in some ways, but you know, we can resolve it by the fact that our program was sponsored from the top. Um, we were able to at least push that down that way. Mm -hmm. I think Michael, Michael wouldn't have too much to say to that because you no, created think, yeah. a team from scratch really as well. Mm -hmm. What about Steve? So I, I think that, I mean, we, we, the business underwent radical change as well. So we've got new business lines and new demands. Um, the, f the force from the organisation to cause us to create more change rapidly shook the tree a bit and shook out some of the people um, that were a little bit more set in their ways, a little bit more procedurally oriented, a little bit more patch controlling. Um, I wouldn't say that DevOps specifically did, but it was a much it was an enabling factor because if we weren't able to deliver on those projects, we weren't able to iterate rapidly and show that uh, we wouldn't have, you know, those people would. Would, would still be there, probably doing happily doing their work, but our processes evolved around them very quickly. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Great question. Thank you for uh, whoever sent that in. Um, the next question I'll pose to the forum is, how do you manage and keep up to date with changes in, in AWS? And um, AWS is a very quickly evolving technology platform. Um, wondering if someone would like to comment on how they keep on top of some of our new services and, and, and enhancements. Know your SA first, <laughs> right? Um, work with work with these guys as much as possible um, is one of the pieces. Um, don't sleep. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sp spend a lot of time playing. I mean, I really, I guess the way I keep up to date with all technology, not just AWS, is I play with it myself. So I'm historically a dev um, that's come at this and, and bringing the dev mentality to the op space. Um, and this is to me is a really cool spot at the moment because it's sort of young and emerging. Um, and you know, the more that you can actually put something into practice, you know, I have an AWS account, I play with it myself, I run a few little services for myself and some mates. Um, you know, so you're playing with it and finding, you know, finding the bits that you care about, right? I mean, Amazon's got a thousand and one services, right? I don't use Kinesis, I don't care about workspaces. I just sort of filter those out. I care about the features that, that I want to know about, you know, playing mm -hmm. with Code Deploy on the weekend, you know, some of the, you know, obviously watching as many keynotes and videos from YouTube as possible on the train, obviously, not <laughs> on the office. Um, but yeah, it's a hard, it's a really hard problem. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to, what we try to do internally is we used to run an internal sort of meetup group. Um, so we had a weekly or bi-weekly, uh, um, sort of internal meetup where different people would come and we would talk about the tools and techniques and things we were playing with. So I knew I didn't have to worry about that to the nth degree. I'd talk to someone else in the organisation that was that cared about that um, and we could collaborate a lot quicker. Lovely. John? Yeah, I think I think for me and for our company, it's it's really, um, you know, what we just see out there on the internet, what we see hear from our partners um, and then, you know, what will come out by these, you know, the, there are newsletters that we see. And, that, and I think our process, you know, We'll generally we'll assess them, see if there's a potential need um, or somewhere where you could use it. Um, a lot of time we can't use it now, but it's something that we, you know, just put a note somewhere going, okay, that could be used in the future somewhere. So, like an example being SQS, we don't use it yet, but we could see it as being a nice way of doing, you know, some type of B2B messaging with um, partners or customers. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so plus one to most of those things. Obviously, we have, you know, regular catch ups with AWS about, uh, you know, the latest technologies as they're being released. Um, we all keep abreast of the technologies ourselves. Uh, but also the, the DevOps team, we intentionally recruited or brought in organizations who are familiar working with AWS, uh, obviously on the infrastructure side with, um, and operation side with Base2, <coughs> but also on the dev side and the test side. So you have to trust that. And one of the things that we, we seek from the DevOps team is that exposure to uh, the reality that there is more than one way to do or to solve any problem let's ask the question, is there an Amazon way to solve this problem? And then ask the question, is that the right solution? So I asked that question of the infrastructure guys and the operations guys for things like well, where we're currently using Chef, should we have been using um, DevWorks, Ops, um, OpsWorks, for example? Or should we be looking at the, the new technologies which have recently been announced around the same space? Uh, within the dev teams, what is the right way to, to deal with um, application code changes, deploy, is code deploy the right way to take this in the future? We don't know yet, mm -hmm. but I, I can trust that uh, there are people in my team who are looking at the Amazon solutions because that's what they do and can bring that knowledge and that learning and that experience back into the, the wider team. And it, this is one of the areas where having an agile team really helps us because almost by definition, you're trusting and, um, and respecting the skills, knowledge and uh, expertise of all of the members of the team. Right, agile doesn't work if you're not doing that. So bringing together each of their individual experiences, what they know about Amazon, what they know about other technologies on the market or from other vendors, um, you, you've got to respect that they've got that knowledge to bring to the table and that can be you know, very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I picked up is, um, you know, as an Amazon person, we, we play a critical point or cr critical part in making sure that we do our job to help customers understand how our new services work. So. Um, I got that from all, all three of you, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, probably just a point to add is that, you know, a new technology comes out, the penalty for it not being useful or failure is, you know, it's small. Mm. It's, as soon as you shut it down, then that's your cost. So, being able to just play with it that quickly, assess it, and go, mm. no, it's not for me, yeah. um, is great. Absolutely. Yeah. Even with the automation as well, if you can, you know, slot in an RDS solution where previously you were using, you know, a bare iron database, it's not hard to do if you've got that level of automation around your infrastructure. If it doesn't work out, then you can back it out. Mm -hmm. so. um, I want to skip to a question that 
I personally am interested in um, in this discussion. What tools did you use to support your DevOps approach and why? Um, Steve, do you want to give that one a go? Yeah, so um, I mean a, a lot of, again, the similar statement, you know, what's the Amazon way of, of, of doing this? Um, and then is it the right approach? So uh, at Jenkins, I think we've mentioned multiple times, uh, cloud formation to, to basically manage the infrastructure. We actually did go the OpsWorks route. So we, um, some of the original open to study elements were using a set of custom baked um, in images and a lot of hand rolled work that actually became more man more pain to manage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to build your own frameworks from scratch is usually the first failure of a dev. Um, but sometimes we need to make those mistakes to learn it's not the right way to do it. Um, the number of engineers probably working on OpsWorks is ten times bigger, you know, probably than the, uh, the than our entire you know dev team. So we moved to OpsWorks for um, Open Training Institute. Um, and now with the new work, we're looking at, you know, looking at how we can leverage that to move towards a uh, full chef managed solution. Um, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, really the, the tools are fairly basic. You know, a lot of, a lot of Python, right? I like, I like Python plus one to Python. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of Python driving the Amazon API to orchestrate pieces between where CloudFormation or Jenkins does some, some of the scheduling and, and process jobbing pieces. Um, yeah, there's, there's a heap, I mean, there's lots of, it really depends on what your solution is mm -hmm. and what tools to use out there. Mm -hmm. uh, John, Michael, did any of your approaches differ? Any technologies that might be a bit different to Steve? Not, not significantly different for me. Um, for us, you know, we obviously use Maven for dependency management, that's because the technology is based on, we use Jenkins, but we use the SaaS solution, which is cloud-based, which fits into our strategy of having everything hosted. Um, we did use JIRA for our bug tracking and did, um, yes. issue management, um, and we actually linked them all together um, back into um, our Git, which was on GitHub. So for instance, our when issues pass and are fixed, they comment back on our JIRA, they go back onto Git. So they're all sort of interlinked and sort of assist in that whole DevOps approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We actually use the establishment of the tools environment as one of the ways of learning more about how to automate uh, infrastructure for us. So we developed a tools environment with, uh, with GitLab, um, JIRA, Confluence, Jenkins CI, other pieces. Um, we, we did all that with CloudFormation worked out how, you know, for our own, particularly internally, for our own learning, and then we were able to use that knowledge to help us with the uh, delivery of real products. Um, the only thing which I'd add to, to what's already been said is that Jenkins, but by integrating CloudFormation and Jenkins together, we've been able to provide a, a developer and, in fact, t a QA resource friendly way of managing infrastructure on demand. So, for example, the, the CI pipeline that we have uh, is entirely managed through, through Jenkins. That will in even provision entirely new environments, for example, a pre-production environment or a, a one-off uh, PVT environment, uh, and tear it down again afterwards. It can do that automatically or by schedule or based on the workflow of the, uh, of the team. Mm -hmm. So our QA guy can go in and say, yep, CI looks good, promote that to, to QA. QA looks good, all right, let's pull that into pre-prod mm -hmm. entirely from inside the, the Jenkins mm -hmm. console. So quite powerful for us. And was that experiential or was that something you, um, someone educated you on what tool chains would be best suited for what you wanted to do? Again, DevOps. So got we got a lot of experience, a lot of feedback and, and advice from Base2 and from AWS Professional Services. And of course, we brought our own experiences from the dev teams and from the QA guys. Mm -hmm. So came together quite well. I think that just that point, I mean, that, that point is a really important point to stress is, um, these pieces of automation actually need to be connected together into sequential steps. Um, and that was the one, the one objective. Uh, so OUA has had a semi-automated deploy process, um, but semi-automated. And it was still individual steps. So I, a developer could push into a dev environment or they could push into a test environment or they could push into prod. The, the change that we made when we really embedded the dev guys and the ops team together was to string those all together. So now no change makes it into the OTI prod without having gone through the test environment into the staging environment into production. And it's not the dev's responsibility to push it. Mm. It's actually the QA team or the, the entire team's actual job to pull. It's really pull oriented. So that next candidate is ready, has passed all of the tests, you know, the unit tests and integration tests underneath. It's a candidate ready to come into our test environment, push the button to pull it up. Mm -hmm push the button to push it into the, you know, to promote it into the pre-pod environment, push the button to pull it into production. Mm -hmm. um, and those steps have to, you know, have to be green. They become, sometimes they're flaky, sometimes they're a little weird things, but it's so much better that it breaks in the pre-prod environment mm -hmm. than that flakiness actually hitting the prod system. Yeah. Um, and that's, re yeah, that's a really key piece of the tool chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and the repeatability and, and the confidence you have in that process. So in our experience, if something's gone through CI, every step along the way from that point on, every time it's pushed to QA, to um, PVT, to training, to production, we have almost 100% certainty if it's past that first push, it'll pass every other one without fail because it's all automated, all repeatable, and it's being tested every single step of the way. Mm -hmm. I think you just encapsulated the whole idea of having a DevOps approach in that last sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might just um, uh, notify everyone that we've, we're actually on time to end the session now, but we're happy to open to the floor for some questions. Um, but I will be happy to give people the opportunity to go to their next meetings um, if they so require. Otherwise, happy to take some questions from the floor. Sure. Yeah, I've got one. Um, how do you manage the account? So um, internally, we've got a perception from the ops guys that you know developers are going to spin up all these things and cost a fortune. How has that been managed, in, and how does it how does it work? So I think in these three <coughs> scenarios, how do you manage that perception that you know developers are going to go crazy? I might, I might repeat the question for the sake of um, the recording. Um, the question was, how do you manage the AWS account in light of cost control and keeping people doing the right things? Yeah. Uh, well, from my experience, we've got a uh, account management strategy, which is uh, for this particular system or set of systems, we have a, a non-production and a production account, two completely separate accounts. Uh, within the non-production account, um, and in fact, in, within both accounts, every application stack or environment is self-contained within a VPC and managed through CloudFormation. So uh, there's a basic rule, and it's not enforced, although it could be, uh, but there's a basic rule which is that you don't make any changes to any of the CloudFormation managed application. Okay? If you want to run up a, an EC2 instance to do something though, go crazy, as long as you, you follow reasonable practices and we trust you, you can go off and make your own yeah, point um, EC2 instance because you want to generate some load or you want to do um, do a uh, you need a, a remote desktop for some purpose that's cool but you can't do it in production you can only do it in the non-production account you don't even have credentials into the production account unless you're qualified to work in that area the novelty wears off pretty quickly too mm -hmm. so yeah, we had the same, we had exactly the same questions. What's going to happen? Ah, people are going to run instances, right? So once you've built a couple of boxes, then they all look the same. Yeah. So um, what ends up happening is that the, the grind of actually doing work and actually delivering value takes over. Um, but having that freedom, having that flexibility to be able to, to know that if I just need to try something over here, um, I can, and you know the cost is relatively negligible. We're putting in place some, um, we've got some, some dashboard management infrastructure in place to, to actually auto scale environments down and stuff overnight. Um, and we're looking at introducing more aggressive policies there of if it isn't specifically known, it just will be shut down each night. So that at worst, someone starts a rogue system, it runs till six o'clock or something, and then it gets stopped. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean they can't come in tomorrow and restart it again. Uh, and then there'll be other things of you know cost allocation, you know, with EC2 tags, other bits and pieces, putting some of that in. Um, we, we, we investigated using Cloudability as a tool to sort of give us reporting um, at a sub-account level by tags and stuff, and that way at least starting to try and create some accountability back to the teams and say, well, you guys built these resources. Um, where are you funding them from? And you know, then they start to understand, well, you've got a budget, but start using small things, you know, turn them off, use it for an hour and turn it off again. Um, most people you know, engage with the process have, have performed pretty well. Yeah. A couple of things to add there, I think, very quickly. Um, trusted Advisor, we use that internally to, to get a view on what resources are actually being used and how they're adding up. So that's a good way to get a snapshot of, um, of what your underutilized components are within, within your account and understand you know, where the, the potential cost savings are. Um, and the other one is just a realization that it's pretty hard for one developer to go crazy and waste a huge amount of money. Right, and particularly get away with it, or one one individual, unless they're you know, um, yeah, mining Bitcoin. Uh, bit, sorry, unless they're they're mining Bitcoin or something, which is going to be caught by Amazon anyway. Um, the chances are they've just got a box, an M3, say, running. It's going to cost you what is it, uh, less than a dollar an hour or so. It's not going to add up that quickly, right? So as long as you do a routine sanity check and you don't have that many people in the environment, it shouldn't get out of control. I uh, was just going to yep. add to that. I think for, for our experience, there's a little more cut and dry. There's a clear handoff between devs and ops. So, um, so the accounts managed by the ops team, but then 
we definitely encourage that the devs work really closely with the ops team to then spin up those new environments. Mm. You know, they, we use you know, Chef and CloudFormation to get those mm. environments up, um, but we don't let them just do it themselves ad hoc. Mm. Okay, that's a very good <laughs> distinction. So it's still on the same question as the structure of the accounts. You said you have set completely separate prod and non-prod. You mentioned sub-accounts? So not sub. So we, we use the same our, our prod and non-prod accounts, but oh, yeah. we we're using cloudability to use resource tagging to sort of create virtual sub accounts. So they're not really not actual Amazon level sub accounts, oh, right. but by putting a consistent set of names and tags against the resources, the um, the resource billing reports that you can get out of Amazon actually let you sort of aggregate. You know, this was team one. This was team create two, a department team three. type the structure. Yeah. To have completely separate accounts for pod and non -pod. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's oh, no sorry, and that's actually extended for, in our experience. Mm. We've extended that across the department. So this stack of, of software has a production and a non-production account, but there are other stacks of software with their own accounts. So oh. we have close to a dozen, I think, different accounts across the department. Right. All cons consolidated under one master account. Yeah. Right, as long as you don't need to connect between them too many times. Then well, it's, even if you do, it's, it's well defined how you do that. So There isn't a, a black and white answer to that to that structure really, it really comes down to who's in your organisation, what workloads are you planning on running on Amazon, how your governance model sits on top of all that. And I think the best way to understand that is to really just discuss it with your Amazon contact and you know whoever else you're working with in the community to work out what the best approach will be. Right. Yep, that's good. Can I get one more question? Yeah. Related to that? Yeah. Um, isolate the architecture. Can you flesh that one out a little bit before it's closed? What did I mean? I say lots of words. <laughs> what did I mean? Um, yeah, so it, part of it, you know, there's a lot of talk about microservices. There's lots of talk about componentization. You know, Amazon announced their Docker, you know, containerization stuff. Um, having more infrastructure at your disposal um, allows you to make more isolated um, elements in, the, in, in your design. So instead of running these big monolithic, you know, 64 core, 300 terabyte RAM boxes that do everything, um, how do we design architecture to be much more componentized and isolated? And by doing, by doing that um, and thinking about high availability and thinking about redundancy and thinking about all those elements, um, you know, once you start to head down that path, having a human being try to build, you know, I think we're talking about there being 42 discrete servers in our production environment that we need to build, who's going to have the time to actually log on to 42 boxes, install the piece of software, you know, that type of thing. So having that DevOps approach where it's all programmatically defined and controlled and especially that most of it's the same, right? Nearly all the boxes are going to be the same OS, they're going to run the same Apache, they're going to run the same whatever, it's just the last little bits that, that go on to them. Um, if you don't take on an automation approach and you don't think about it as, as code and not as fixed infrastructure, you'll be forever, like you'll be one guy's job logging into all the boxes every day to do some sort of change. So, you, so the, the benefit of being with the DevOps approach in AWS is that you can isolate the Correct, architecture. yes. Yeah. Oh. And, and, it, and again, it's about removing, you know, moving back to that single concern. You know, so instead of having a DNS server that also does <coughs> mail, that also does, that also does. Where's and then, the load coming from? Uh, well, uh, you would need to reboot the box because there's something wrong with DNS. Means mm -hmm. we bring down mail, means we bring down this, means we bring down, you know, that. Um, actually having those, you know, run lots of, you know, M3 Three. smalls instead of lots of, you know, extra yep. larges. Uh, that would be, that's, and that helps your cost profile too because you can scale the right service up. Instead of running all of them up, just run the web tier up or just the app tier or, whatever you happen to need. Great question, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> throw it at us. How do you start the process? Like, is it, is it, it was the key sort of success thing for all three of you was that there was support it from the top <coughs> to move to the cloud? Like, how did you start the process? Um, was it the developers, like the educational process? Like, is it just someone came in one day and said, hey, we're going to AWS in the cloud, this is, looks awesome. How did how did you get the whole team on board and skilled up um, at the same time to, to move at the same pace? Or was that something that was orchestrated from the top? You, you guys start. I'm sure, I, think, I think we're <laughs> yeah. actually we're yeah. sitting where we're, we're different approaches. Oh, I think it's so different. Yeah, I think it was clear. It was very much mandated from the top for me. So it was all for service stream. Um, there was a clear strategy. There was a clear direction, um, and. We already decided on the partner who we're going to work with to actually implement that. So, uh, 
it, it definitely helped us to come from the top down, I think, in this, in this instance. Mm -hmm. um, they've definitely helped us get there quicker. Yeah, in terms of AWS for us, we already had a couple of um, major systems, emergency management systems, which were hosted in AWS, and a, a compelling business case for using something like AWS because of the spikiness of emergency management systems. They, they don't get used at all until there's emergency and then everybody is on board and you don't know when that's going to be. So having scalable infrastructure, on-demand infrastructure, uh, that was an easy call for us to go with Amazon or one of the other uh, infrastructure providers. Um, and for the rest of it, well, we formed a team with the skills that we required. So we, um, the technical leadership, myself included, we said, okay, it's going to be Amazon, it's going to be, um, it, it's going to be Agile, it's going to be DevOps. <clears throat> now let's construct a team which can fulfill the promise of that approach. Whereas we came from the bottom up, right? We came from me and a couple of other people that wanted to do this because we're, 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 so devs historically want to play with the new shiny thing. Um, want uh, this infrastructure problem to not hold us back, to not get in our way. Um, we want to bring them on the journey for, you know, and then the business had the problem in front of us. I mean, we were sort of right place, right time, you know. Business had a problem that needed scale, that needed that flexibility, um, that was actually, you know, low risk to the core business initiative, so they were willing to try something. Um, uh, and it was, but it was really about proof, right? It, it, this, you can try and argue and stand in front of whiteboards with dot points in front of boards and bits and pieces. The, the simplest, I, I still remember the day that we set up an auto scaling group that ran Moodle, that we load tested with some sort of load, you know, you know Google load test in the cloud, find whatever it was, and watched it auto scale up and watched the load stay consistent and the graphs and took them into people and said, so show me how you do that in a day from concept to delivery anywhere else without this capability. And that was sort of the aha moment where people went, well, maybe it could work. And from then on, everything flowed. I might reiterate that in the engagements that sort of we've had with, with customers, it's really been proving that an idea works and then buying the sponsorship of someone who sits at the executive level or who has a stake in the business to then drive that agenda down based on a factual result that you've been able to take to him and say, this is what we can achieve. And the fact that we don't have to, um, you don't have to commit to any sort of contract or anything like that to actually try this stuff out, it's basically you testing your theory and validating your own theory in front of your peers um, to get that sponsorship. Anyone else? Great question though, very good question. Yeah. This is really a question for you, Michael. Just wondering if uh, what else is happening in this respect in the Victorian government. I appreciate you might not be able to answer that, but uh, any comments? So, in emergency management, Victoria, we're, I believe we're largely leading the way within the state government of Victoria in the use of cloud services. However, we've been, you know, within our team, we work very closely with the Department of Justice, uh, the CIO, David Brown there. We work with uh, DSDBI and Grantly Mails, uh, Head of Innovation over there. Um, and we've been engaging across the sector with, um, with the sorts of questions which lead an organisation to the cloud. Things like, how do you scale? How do you respond to dramatic upsurges in, in usage? How do you uh, secure? How do you manage the infrastructure spend? How do you deal with the capital versus operational expenses related to uh, running a, a highly available service? How do you provide high availability and disaster recovery? We're asking those questions in a, a fairly directed way because we want more organisations within state government to realise that this is a good idea, right? We don't want to be the only ones. This is a good idea because it solves some fundamental problems which we have all individually faced in the different departments. And by heading in the same direction, we can all learn from each other. So the rest of the state government, I, I believe are generally t uh, heading in the direction of cloud-based computing, not all or even mostly towards Amazon. Other options are on the table and being pursued. Um, but I think this is the future for state government infrastructure. Yes? Uh, with the elasticity of the cloud, how do you manage your software licenses? I might just yep. repeat. So we manage our software licenses right. by not having very many of them. <laughs> um, so fundamental, if, uh, being in all seriousness and, and all earnest, we, we look for AWS to provide scale, right? Scale doesn't work with 
rigid licensing agreements with vendors. Yeah? So when there's an option between a, a high quality vendor provided solution with an encumbrance with a license against it and an open source or a freely available alternative, which perhaps isn't as rich but doesn't have that constraint, it's always our preference to go open source. Um, and that's been a hard decision at times and in fact it's a continual debate in many areas where you're talking to a, another organisation which uses a particular licensed software, a very expensive one, maybe it's Oracle based, maybe it's um, something else, but <coughs> we have to have that debate. We have to say it's been a, a tenant of our approach that we go open source because we want to be able to go from here to here in 10 minutes if required. Right? And we don't want to then have to pay years worth of, of equivalent fees for having done so. Yeah, completely echo that. Same experience for us. We didn't want to get bogged down with you know, um, figuring out enterprise agreements with you know, particular vendors. Um, it was very much the quickest way there was to go with the open source approach, which was very much reflected in you know, us going Linux, um, going you know, a open source ESP. So you know, definitely worked for us. We try to avoid licenses where possible. Mm -hmm. It's yep. actually and that, it's actually a challenge for us at the moment. So we have a whole lot of legacy history systems, um, and the, the the debate that we have is um, what are we optimizing for? So you know we can buy an off the shelf product from a big organization and it gives us supposed capability um, up front, and maybe that doesn't cost us as much as an initial dev cost, but maybe it costs us long term in maintenance costs. It costs us in limiting our ability to scale and be responsive definitely costs us in support in the long term. Um, but that's a moving piece. I mean, that, the answer of that on-demand is as long as the big guys can catch up an on-demand license, then we would have no problems in using their yep. products. Yeah. Um, but it's the fact that you can't on-demand license all of it. I mean, that's where RDS is good in a way because there is the, at least the option there with some of the licenses around you know, the Oracle and SQL Server pieces that are rolled into the hourly cost. Um, it would be much easier just to use MySQL for everything else. But, um, but yeah, until the big vendors can start lining up behind that on-demand capability, they're going to see themselves losing market share rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd refer you to the AWS marketplace. Um, I think that's the future of, of licensed software in the cloud, right? where you're licensing the usage of, of an application or a piece of software based on the number of instances of, of machines that you have running in any given hour. right? So if you're running ten of them then you get ten times the charge of running one of them for the, the duration of that usage. That's quite reasonable. We'd be quite happy with that. Mm. And as you say, Oracle RDS yeah. is a good example of a Oracle SQL Server anyway, RDS, is a good example of um, of how you can integrate a, a vendor license into an on-demand model. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you for asking that. We might um, wrap that up officially. A few of the panellists here will be sticking around and uh, we'll be happy to have a, a more intimate chat with you if you've got more questions. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming in today and giving us your time. Uh, stories were quite inspirational and thank you to the audience for coming and spending your time to hear about uh, how these organisations have moved into a more DevOps model um, and uh, use AWS as an enabler. So please feel free to stick around and uh, if there are any other questions we'll be happy to take those uh, offline. Thank you.